Hey everyone, it's Sunday morning, it's 11 o'clock and you are so welcome to worship here with us at Central or wherever you are this morning, uh, whatever life looks like, whether you are on the sofa with a cup of coffee, ready to go, or whether you're just getting up, you're still in your jammies, you're watching us from bed, you're so welcome uh, with us at church here today. It's our prayer that God meets with you uh, wherever you are. I just have a couple of announcements I want to run through uh, this morning just before we jump straight into worship. And uh, the first of them is just to say um, that next week, okay, there's a couple of things that are a bit different. So from next week onwards, we're going to be opening up pre-service prayer to the whole church. Uh, up until now, we've been running uh, ministry prayer times before church every Sunday, uh, but we really feel that in this season, it's important that we invite all of you who really want to, uh, to join us in pre-service prayer. So that will happen at 10.30 every Sunday, and to join in that call, which will be on Zoom, uh, there will be a link in your emails from next week um, so that you can jump in on that. We're not sharing that out in terms of social media or anything like that, because we feel it's important that it's our church community that engages with that call. So if you want to get on um, uh, the pre-service prayer time, then you need to be getting our emails. If you're not getting those, uh, why don't you get in touch with us and we'll get make sure that you're on the list and receiving those from next Sunday. So that's pre-service prayer next Sunday, 10.30. The link will be in your email. The next thing to say is that next Sunday, we're also doing communion together as a church. that will form our response uh, to what we're digging into in terms of God's word. So it's just to say that if you're doing your shop this week uh, to make Make sure that you grab some bread and some wine or fruit juice, just some way that you will be able to take bread and wine at home as we share and lead you here in terms of the online content. So communion next Sunday, make sure you got your stuff. This Wednesday night at eight o'clock is the first of our kind of revised program uh, for our communities. And so we will be doing worship together as a church. That will go out via our YouTube channel. It'll premiere at eight o'clock. We would love you to join with us uh, as we worship God in our homes. I realize that that maybe looks a little bit different, okay? I know that some of us envisage that that looks like us watching a TV screen, singing along at home. Uh, and actually for some of you, that's not how it looks at all. I would just encourage you at home as I encourage you you here at Sunday, uh, you here on a Sunday to worship God however it is you feel comfortable and you see fit. So if that's song, we'd love you to sing. If that's writing, we'd love you to write. If that's drawing and painting, we'd love you to do that. If that is the time that you would like to just meditate, pray, just spend some time listening uh, and listening to God, then I, I would just encourage you to do that however you feel comfortable and however you feel led. So it, it's really just creating space for you to worship God at home and that'll be Wednesday night, 8 o'clock via the YouTube channel. The Wednesday after that is a communities night via Zoom. So uh, if you're in a community, they'll be in touch with links so that you can, you can engage with that. Uh, if you're not, and we know that lots of you are joining communities in this season, welcome. Uh, then uh, why don't you drop us an email at central at carmoney.org and we'll link you in uh, with our communities to try and get you into one that feels like a good fit in this particular season. So that's community. Wednesday night, 8 p.m. for worship. And really the last thing I want to announce or say this morning is some happy news uh, that in the last week, it was actually last Saturday night, uh, Ralph Boyd Douglas was born uh, to Megan and Stuart. It's their second baby. We are so very pleased. We're so happy for you guys. Uh, Stuart, Meg, Freddie, Ralph, we love you. We are behind you. We realize that we can't see you and uh, uh, support you maybe in the ways that we would like to at this time, but know that we love you as a church, that we're praying for you. And right now there's a team arranging uh, a way that we support and encourage you and just provide for you in terms of some food and all that stuff in this next season. So if you're in a community already, you might have already um, given and been part of, of really just giving them a bit of a package to support them and encourage them just now. But Meg and Stuarty, uh, Freddie and Ralph, just know uh, that you have have our very best prayers in these days. Pray that you guys are settling in uh, to a family of four, uh, that God is with you, um, and that your time together as a family in these kind of crazy, amazing early days is just really fruitful, good time, gold time, if you will. That's us for this morning with announcements. I'm going to pray. I'm going to hand over to Hannah. He's going to lead us in worship this morning. So let's pray. Jesus, you are Lord of our lives. You're Lord of every detail. 
you're Lord of the big stuff and the small stuff. And Jesus, we ask you today, would you come to us? We ask you to come and to challenge our hearts. We ask you to comfort weary hearts and weary heads. We ask you to heal. We ask you to restore. We ask you to revive and renew and encourage and equip us this morning for the road that you have marked for us. Jesus, we ask, would you move in our homes? Would you move in our families today? Would you be alive in our worship? And as your word is read and preached this morning, God, I just pray that you would draw close to us. Lord, we need you, we love you, we trust you. Come to us today, for it's in your name we pray, amen. Over to you, Hannah.
Okay, thanks so much for leading us this morning, Hannah. If you've got a Bible on you at home, why don't you grab it now or on your phone? Uh, we're going to be reading uh, this morning from, from Mark's Gospel. We're reading from Mark 4, verses 21 to 25. That's Mark 4, 21 to 25. And this is God's word. He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? Whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And we thank God for his word as it still speaks to us today. Amen. So today is the final session in our series, Walking Through the Parables of Jesus. Uh, We called it The Kingdom of Heaven is Like, and that's because through the parables that are laced all the way through the Gospels, Jesus' primary method of teaching, he is painting a picture of just what the Kingdom of Heaven is like through story. And this week, the Kingdom of Heaven is hidden in sight. I was catching up uh, with someone from church a couple of weeks ago. We were chatting about lockdown and life and all the rest of the stuff that you do at this moment in time. And so we got talking about church and how they were finding life in community. And it was great to hear what God is doing in their life. And and they were sharing a bit about what God had been doing through their, their small group community and all of that sort of stuff. And then they said, I'm just getting so much from the teaching at Central. So in my heart of hearts, I'm feeling pretty good about myself right now, right? And so they go on. I listen back to the podcast every week. Some weeks, I don't really have an awful lot of time, if I'm honest. So, but I've found that I listen to your talks on 1.2 or 1.5 speed, because you can do that on Spotify. And I'm like, what? Hold the phones. What did you just say? Like, what even is this? But sure enough, as I found out later on, you can go into the playback options in Spotify when you listen to podcasts and you can turn up the original speed to 1.2 times, 1.5 times, twice, three times the speed, whatever you want to do. Mind blown. Like, I'm not feeling so great about myself right now that people are speeding me up to listen to me just so they can get it over with faster. I mean, I went and tried to listen to it myself and I sound like some sort of chipmunk talking about Jesus. The thing is, when I listened to it, I wasn't sure that I could take anything in. Like, it's so fast. It's skipping through content so quickly. How can you possibly take anything in? You must be a better man than I. And for the original listeners of Jesus, the ones showing up in their crowds just to hear him speak, the ones incidentally caught in the synagogue as Jesus begins to debate with the scribes and the Pharisees, the ones who come with questions, the ones who come with people who needed healing, the ones who come to hear him speak, they only got one chance to hear what Jesus had to say. They only heard it once. They didn't have things as we have them now and couldn't pour over commentaries and cross-references and analyze structures and construction. If they didn't pay attention, there was no opportunity to listen back. There was no podcast. There was definitely no 1.5 times playback. And if they missed it, they missed the story. They'd miss the point. They'd miss the kingdom it would be a costly loss. And it would mean that in the original context of the parables that we have been walking through week after week, listeners had to really listen. That's why we get that line in the short passage in verse 23. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Or as Eugene Peterson will paraphrase it in the message, are you listening to this? Really listening. And there's this sense when we come to Jesus' life and message that in many ways we now have a clearer view of the kingdom than the first listeners, but we are every bit as much at risk of not hearing it. There's this sense that those words of Jesus then should resonate as strongly with us now as they did then, even though we probably have a clearer view of the kingdom. And to close off this series, actually, I'm coming clean this morning. We're not so much looking at a parable, but one of the shorter illustrations that Jesus tends to use, a metaphor. He uses it often 
as he speaks. He's talking about light. And it's perhaps best known from the reference in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, where he talks about salt, uh, the salt of the earth and the light of the world, right? And when it appears through the Gospels, the point is the same each time. The light has a purpose, to light things up and that light shouldn't be hidden. And in particular, this section falls in Mark's gospel right after the parables of the sower. And then after the parables of the sower, Jesus gives his interpretation of what he's trying to say in that parable. Not just that parable, but the parables. And then he finishes up explaining and he runs into this metaphor that we're reading today, that we are to live lives as lamps not hidden under baskets. Here's the thing, in verse nine, as he told the parable of the sower, he said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And then in verse 23, he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Twice, he's saying, listen up, because Jesus is trying to say something that it would be costly to miss. We started this series pretty close at the beginning with the parable of the sower, digging into just how important it is for our Christian faith. And Jesus used that line and we finish with the analogy of light and he uses the line again to tell us to listen up. And as we finish off today, what are we taking from the parables? As you reflect on this last uh, period of time, which has been such a changeable period of our lives in this world, as we were locked down and we opened up and now we've locked back down again. We've been navigating the parables through that time. What are we taking from the parables? What will be the memory? What will be the change in our lives? Because again and again and again, with all Jesus had to input across the parables, he was constantly calling us and everyone who had an ear to hear to make a choice about who he is and how we are to live. He is or he isn't who he says he is. We're in or we're out. It's the kingdom or all the kingdoms of the world. And as we close off today, I close off this series today, the parables come with promise and with a warning. The first of those is a promise. Let's just read those first few verses again, okay? He said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. So the metaphor of this passage, the one that Jesus uses often, is that our lives are to be lived as light is to be seen. In other words, the Christian life in its very nature is meant to be conspicuous. It's meant to be obvious. I don't know about you, but the tendency of most people I know when they read this passage and they read that line that says, whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed and the concealed coming out in the open bed is to straight away think about their lives and have a bit of a panic about just what's going to come out in the open, isn't it? Like that feeling you get when you're driving down the motorway at whatever speed you're driving, whether you're under the limit, whether you're over the limit, right? I'm not judging today, but you're driving up the motorway. At some point you see blue flashing lights come on in your rear view mirror and your immediate reaction is to panic that they have come on for you. And when we think about our lives, we are so often guilty of hiding, aren't we? You see, we hide things from ourselves, character traits, things we do, even gifts. We turn a blind eye to the way we live and we point fingers at the way other people live. We hide things from ourselves, we hide things from each other, the us behind the scenes, habits, lifestyles, or at least often we think we've hidden them well from other people. We hide them from each other. Finally, we hide things from God, or at least we try to. But here's the thing, we can't. We can't truly hide things from ourselves. We're not nearly as good at hiding things from others and we cannot hide things from God. And whilst it's true that one day all we are and all that we've lived for will be laid bare, that's not actually the hiddenness that the passage is pointing at, right? We read it, we think it's about us, we probably panic. But the passage isn't pointing at shameful or guilty or wrongful hiddenness. It's not about us. It's a promise. And the promise is that God is revealing the hidden secret in Jesus. You might remember 
in Luke 4, as Jesus is setting out in his ministry, announcing the kingdom, he says this, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant. He sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In the synagogue, on the Sabbath, in his hometown with every eye fixed on him, reading the words of the prophet Isaiah that they probably all would have known. He tells the whole world exactly why he has come and exactly who he is. And as we read today about the hidden things becoming clear, really it's Jesus saying, I am telling you these things now in secret. But the reason for announcing the kingdom and for bringing God's light into the world is so that everyone will see it. You see, this is a promise. It's not a cause for panic. The promise is not to worry. Soon the kingdom message will be known by everyone. This is all about a promise about what is and about what is still to come. And thank God for the promise when you look at the world in which we live. We need the reassurance of promises like this when you think about it. Why do I say that? Well, I say that because all the way through this series, Jesus has been provoking us, rewiring us to imagine the world his way. Imagine the world that Jesus paints. Imagine our lives as Jesus paints, marked by generosity and openness, marked by his spirit and the life of another world, marked by hope, marked by grace, marked by forgiveness, marked by peace, marked by the belief that the world is truly as Jesus is teaching us and not as the world is telling us. And the thing is, to live lives that look like that and follow Jesus like that, we need to live with a hope and an expectation that there is more. Either Jesus, either Jesus' picture of the world is true or our newsfeed's picture of the world is true. We need to live with a hope and an expectation that there is more. But my goodness, we live in a cynical world, don't we? I say a cynical world like it's something out there, but really it's us, isn't it? We are the cynical ones. I say this often, but in Northern Ireland, we are especially gifted at cynicism, aren't we? Like we feel like it's our mission in life to squash down dreamers and be suspicious of people who live with great expectations. Like we're just bringing a bit of realism to proceedings, performing our public service. It's no good going over the top, right? Don't get carried away with yourself. We say that often, the masters of tall poppy syndrome, the kings of playing ourselves and everyone else down. And here's the thing about cynicism. It's not just out there. It's in here isn't it? It's well and truly alive in the church too. John Tyson writes this, we are cynical about people who show genuine enthusiasm, believing their naivety will be crushed by pain. We're cynical about God moving because we've witnessed too many unanswered prayers. We're cynical about the possibility of things changing for the better because we know how hard life can be. And then he goes on. So instead of being a people who have good news to share and news that could transform the world, we've become a people mired in the 24-hour news cycle, fed a constant diet of hopelessness and despair. Our ability to dismiss the work of God in the church has become toxic. We are plagued by a lack of expectation and have begun to believe that this is all there is. Recognize this? I think we all can because I think it's all of us at times, isn't it? You see, this is a promise that the picture Jesus has been painting all along is the true reflection of the world. And one day, not just us, but everyone will see him for who he truly is, the world as it truly is. He's saying the way I'm calling you to live, the abundance of our lives sown by the sower in that parable is coming. I promise, because one day we will all see 
Jesus for who he really is. Here's the thing. Jesus is speaking to these listeners who had heard him, not me. They'd heard him speak and seen the miracles he had performed. But even that wouldn't be enough to live this way. They would need to respond for themselves and begin to live into the world Jesus paints. I love this quote from Randy Alcorn about our world. I've never been to heaven, yet I miss it. Eden is in my blood. The best things of life are souvenirs from Eden, appetizers of the new earth. There's just enough of them to keep us going, but never enough to make us satisfied with the world as it is, ourselves as we are. We live between Eden and the new earth, pulled towards what we once were and what we yet will be. Desire is a signpost pointing to heaven. Every longing for better health is a longing for the new earth. Every longing for romance is a longing for the ultimate romance with Christ. Every thirst for beauty is a thirst for Christ. Every taste of joy is but a foretaste of a greater, more vibrant joy than can be found on earth as it is now. We were made to long for the world made new, to long for the world as it truly is, to long for what is to come. And in Jesus' coming, his announcing of the kingdom, he is promising us that one day we'll see that which we long for. This is a promise, a promise of Jesus that needs to win over the cynicism that so easily leaks into our Christian lives, the type of promise that should drive our living. But we need to persistently posture ourselves towards hope. How? Well, I just have one practical suggestion today, and it's our testimony, our own personal stories of hope. I said that because a number of weeks ago, I sat through the eldership training that was happening before myself and three others from our leadership team were ordained in the full Presbyterian eldership. And as part of that, you're interviewed really just to assess whether you're actually suitable uh, to be an elder. And, and as they interview you, one of the things that they do is they ask you to tell your testimony. And I sat in a room with other members of our leadership team, people I know really well, have known for a really long time, and I listened as for the first time I heard them share their testimonies. Simple stories. None of them, I am on one hand sad to reveal, led crazy lives as drug dealers or gun runners and had their lives completely turned around by Jesus. That's not it. They all had stories where they had gone to church and they had grown up in a Christian home and that God had come and moved in their lives and something real had happened and one day they had decided to follow Jesus. And you know what? As I listened that evening, it really moved me. It moved me deep in the depths of where I was at in that moment, started to rewire me again towards hope and an expectation that Jesus is who he says he is and he still does what he says he does. When was the last time you shared yours? I'm not talking about, you know, you went out on the streets and started to share your testimony with anyone that would listen. I'm talking about just the organic sharing of what Jesus has done in your life. When was the last time? Why don't you try and share it with someone today. See, this is a promise. The call to live as light is a promise. But secondly, it's a warning. It's a warning. This is how the passage goes on in verse 24 and 25. Con consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And even more, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. The whole way through Jesus' ministry, as he travels with the disciples, one of the repeated features is their struggle to understand and really get what he's saying. Like they miss it so frequently. When you read something like Mark's gospel, you, you almost start to begin to believe that Jesus is kind of like disdainfully going, why are you still not getting this? As he tries to teach on beyond what he taught the crowds that day. But I have sympathy for them because there's, also, there's almost also the sense that Jesus, as he teaches, that some of what he says, he deliberately keeps hidden. Like it's, it's deliberately cryptic. And yet watching how the disciples live when Jesus is gone, watching how the message of Jesus spreads like wildfire throughout the known world, it's so very clear that in the end, they absolutely get it. 
You see, it's this paradox where hidden things become more visible. Something lightly hidden becomes even more visible. Joy and I started watching the Netflix uh, series on the Night Stalker serial killer uh, from LA in the 1980s over the last week. Side note, if you choose to watch it, um, you will very definitely find yourself going around your house at the end of the night checking all the doors and windows much more thoroughly than you ever have before, okay? You have been warned. Anyway, we watched it in this last week and there's this central feature of the show. I promise I'm not gonna ruin it. This feature is a particular shoe print. And the thing about it is, I've never paid any attention in my life before. I've never really even noticed a single shoe print before. Like I walk over them every day. It, the, the ground is wet everywhere at this moment in time. Every shop you walk into, there are shoe prints on the ground. They are everywhere, and I've never, ever noticed them until now. And now it's all that I can see. The hidden has become more visible. And the visibility of the kingdom is critically important. The thing about that is, though, that it will be us who makes it visible. That the hiddenness of your relationship with Jesus becomes the obvious visibility of the kingdom at work in the world. The visibility of the kingdom as you live it out. So here's the warning. Hide it and you misuse it. Hide it and you lose it. Hide it and you mis misuse it. Hide it and you will lose it. You see, Jesus' picture is of a clay light or, or lantern. Uh, and you know that if you cover it, it goes out, doesn't it? Like a tea light holder. If you put a cover over the top of it, the tea light goes out. The light is extinguished. In Northern Irish terms, right? One way to think about it is as the big light, right? Every house has a big light and it's a special sort of weirdo that lives their life with the big light on, right? Isn't it? Because it's too bright. There's no ambience with the big light on. And in the end of the day, the whole point of the big light is when it's on, you can see everything. The small text in a book, find the earring that you drop. There's no point in the big light if it's not a bright light. So what are we to do? We are to live it. The warning is a call to live and to live as Jesus calls us. Consider carefully what you hear. He continued, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Jesus is saying, that in receiving him and his message, seeing the light as his listeners did, the call was to live it out as he called. And that's what the word measure was all about. Actually, it's, it, it, it's the picture of scales, which we used to trade in every marketplace, that this weight of whatever was worth this weight of whatever, right? So the measure you receive is the measure that you live. I personally didn't have many parenting wins through lockdown one, I've mentioned it before. But one of them was with L and dogs, right? So we would go out every day to do our exercise. When you've got a toddler, that means you just go out the front door and let them go a bit mad and run around the place. And where we lived in our old house, there was like a green square out to the front of the house. So we would go out the front door, we would cross the road and Elle would just run. We'd play chases, we'd climb trees, we'd kind of just have fun, throw frisbee, kick football, whatever. The only problem with that was because everybody else was locked down, everybody walked their dogs around the same time. So every day we'd go out and there were lots of dogs being walked. Elle loves dogs, right? And she would make a beeline for any dog that she could see, even the huge ones, right? Like Alsatians, massive dogs. Elle is like running right at them with her wee hand straight out to try and pet this dog, going straight for the pat on the head. And so one day I, I sat, sat her down and told her how we just needed to be careful around dogs. Not all dogs are friendly. Not all dogs have had a really good upbringing and all of that sort of stuff, right? I'm doing the adult chat. So I tell her, you know, that she needs to let them come to her. She keeps her hands by her side. She opens her palms. She never stretches out hands or one day it might get nipped. And I was like, okay, do you understand? And she just said, okay. There wasn't the usual barrage of a hundred questions. She didn't argue. That was it. And I thought, well, that's not been listened to. Except every single time since then, she has been around a dog. She has done everything I said, like 
perfect. She is the most dog safe person you have ever seen to the point that I now hear her telling her other little friends, no, 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 you don't do that. You do this and showing them. She does it every single time. The Stoic philosopher Ep Ep Epictetus said this, have you ever noticed that a sheep does not vomit up the grass it ate at the feet of the shepherd in order to impress him? The sheep digests it to produce wool and milk. In other words, truth understood is of no value. It is truth acted upon which changes things. Jesus was saying, are you listening? Are you really listening? And the question is, how do you know if someone has really listened? Not by regurgitating your words back to you, but by living out those words. And what's more, this is a promise that as we go deeper and deeper into what Jesus is saying and doing and living it out with our lives, the rewards turn out to be greater and greater too. But if we remain at the superficial level, we'll lose it all. You see, this was a crowd that were running after Jesus to hear him speak. They'd heard of the miracles. They'd heard that something incredible was happening at the time. They were following the buzz. Like so often we follow the buzz of a church service or a big event or a youth event when we were a young person. So many young people give their lives to Jesus uh, on the back of all that's happening at those events. And if you keep your following at a superficial level, even that buzz will be lost. Even the buzz will be lost because the buzz is never enough. It's a bit like physical fitness in many ways. It's an incredible thing that when you feel fit, like you've been training hard, you have a good level of fitness, that when you feel fit and you push yourself, it feels so incredibly rewarding, doesn't it? Like every session feels like you get fitter and faster and stronger. It feels like a joy to do it. You feel like you make so much progress with every run or cycle or gym session. You're getting better and better and it's an incredibly enjoyable experience. And yet the other incredible thing about fitness is no matter how fit you are, the incredible thing is just how fast you lose it when you stop. The kingdom is to be lived, not just heard, not just understood, not poured over in academia. It's the kingdom to live by and live out. All the values of the parables of these last 14 or 15 weeks, all of the values, all of that vision is to be lived with all of our lives. And as we do, we find that not only do we push back the cynical sense of our lives, that this is it, to find that there is more, but that there is always more and more and more and more. See, this is a promise. The promise of what Jesus revealed now and the promise of that one day everyone will see the world as he teaches us to see it. And secondly, this is a warning that if we hide it, we misuse it. And if we hide it, we lose it. That we need to live out the kingdom as we hear it today. Promises and warnings. You know, just as we finish up today, the series has been all about trying to see the world as Jesus sees it and teaches us to see it. Jesus' picture, not just of the kingdom as some ethereal thing that's like out there. And as Jesus teaches it, it's like, oh, it's kind of an out there thing. How does that change anything today? Actually, as Jesus teaches it, the exact reason was it was meant to change our today the true picture of our lives and the world in an endless ocean of competing images of our lives and this world. He is teaching us to see the world another way. He's asking us to choose what we believe and if we believe it enough to live by it. So the question is today, whose picture of the world do we choose to believe, Jesus or everyone else? And if we believe it, do we believe it enough to start to live by it? So do we. And what next? Live it or don't? Jesus leaves it up to us. You know, our next series at Central is going to be on formation, looking at how we build into our lives rhythms and practices that form us and form our view of the world into the biblical view, the Jesus view. And actually next week, before we jump into that series, we're going to be coming to the table again, where all, where all of it meets. 
where all of our humanity with all of his divinity and the incredible sacrifice that he made around a table that he prepares for us to come as we are, tattered, battered, frail, feeble faith and all. But today, today is a marker. There is a promise a promise that he is everything he says he is and that one day everyone will see it as he sees it. And there is a warning that we are not to hide it. If we hide the light that is in our lives, we misuse it. And if we hide it, we lose it. The question is, which one of those have you heard today? Have you heard the promise? Have you needed to hear the promise? Have you needed to hear that his Jesus picture of the world is the real picture, not the despair that you feel as you scroll through news feeds? You know, there is a term now for scrolling through Twitter and going down the rabbit hole of bad news. It's called doom scrolling. And that feels like so much of the world in which we live, doesn't it? Maybe you needed to hear the promise today, the promise that of the incredible news, the incredible story of just what Jesus did and his arrival and his announcing of the kingdom and his life and death, his resurrection, his infilling of us with the Holy Spirit and his propelling of us outwards onto his kingdom mission in the world. It starts with seeing the world as he calls us and teaches us to see it through story. Maybe you needed to hear that promise today that that is the true picture of the world that one day everyone will see. Or maybe you needed to hear the warning today. Maybe you needed to reflect today on just how you're living. Maybe there's aspects of your life, areas that you're holding back, areas that you're trying to hide, where today you're saying to Jesus again, I need to live out as light with all of who I am and what I have. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and to minister to us where we are this morning. So let's pray. Maybe just where you are today, if God has been speaking through these parables, God's been moving in your life as maybe the kingdom has been getting illuminated to you. Maybe you just want to hold your hands out in front of you just as a sign that you'd like to receive. And so we pray, come Holy Spirit. We pray the oldest prayer of the church, come Holy Spirit. Come today, Lord. And minister to us your promise and your warning. Minister to us today, Lord, the promises, God, of which the promises you make to us are almost endless, that you are faithful, that you're good, that you're true, that you're merciful and gracious, that you will not leave us or forsake us or abandon us, that you are with us right to the very end of the age, that you go before us and beside us, that your spirit has filled us, that we are saved, that you were a ransom for many, that you love us, that you are for us. Jesus, minister your promise to us us again today. Lord, help us see the world as you see it. Help us believe, God, believe, truly believe that your picture of the world is the true picture of the world, Lord. Help us receive the promise today that one day, not just us, but everyone will see you for who you truly are, high and lifted up. Minister to us today. And Lord, receive to us a warning today too. A warning that we need to live out as light. A warning that speaks to our hiding, our hiding things from ourselves, our hiding things from each other, our hiding things even from you. Jesus, might we have the courage to hear your warning today and do something about it. Holy Spirit, stir in our lives, stir up gifts, stir up generosity, stir up compassion, stir up a passion for your name in all of the earth. Holy Spirit, move in us today, we pray. Jesus, we long to see you for who you are. Come and speak to us today. Come and renew us and restore us, and redirect us on your way. Amen.
Yeah, God, we ask that you would be our fire. God, would we be the light because we are on fire with you in this world that needs it so much, in this world that is so much in darkness. Would you be the light in us? Would we reflect you into this world? God, we thank you for who you are and who you are to us, who you are to the world. God, thank you that you are our saviour. Thank you for speaking to us this morning, God. To you be the glory, Jesus. Amen.